I forgot to welcome in the graduates that are going to be recognized in a few moments. So let's stand, please, and have the call to worship. The voice of God gathers us this day. So we come with joy and sorrow in our hearts. With kindness and with selfishness. With doubt and with faith. So may we bring the fullness of our lives to God. May we worship well this day. Our song. Standing on the Promises. I want to start off by congratulating you on your hard work to getting to this point. You guys put in the work over the years, I did a, stayed up a lot of late nights, put a lot of hard work in, so you guys should be proud of what you have done. And as you go through this time of celebrating, you know, I want to remind you of a couple of things. I want you to be reminded of that you did not get to this point alone, that it took your family and the support of a community to get you where you're at today. So remember to thank your parents, to thank your family members for helping you get to this point. And I also want to remind you to praise God during this time as well, because it is God who got you here, who has sustained you through this time, and because this graduation that you are experiencing is a good thing. It is a good thing to graduate. And the Bible tells us that all good things come from God. James 1.17 says this, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So remember during this time while you're celebrating to continue to give God praise. So at this point, I would like it if you guys can share with me where you graduated from as well as your plans for this next chapter. Does this mic come on, Don? I'm from Red Line High School, and I plan on going to Penn State York for marketing. Awesome job. 
I graduated from your college of Pennsylvania with a master's, I mean, yeah, no, a bachelor's in fine arts. <laughs> <laughs> I will be going on to get my master's at Penn West in art therapy. Awesome job. So I'll take that from you guys. Thank you. So I'll just sit this here for a moment. Put that stuff in here. So at this time, I'd like to present you with some gifts that the church has provided to you guys. So Ms. Haley, here you go. And Ms. Kelsey, this is on behalf of the church. And these gifts are a reminder that the church is always here to support you along the way. Uh, wherever you need, we are here for you guys. We are praying with you. We are here to lean on as you get ready to go into this next chapter of your life. I know there is an urge and a desire at this point to, to prove yourself, to do things on your own, but no one gets to anywhere on their own account. That's why you have a church family here to be able to lean on uh, during this next time in your life. So uh, at this time, I would like if you guys could just bow your heads and uh, congregation, if you could stand uh, or arm out with me as I get ready to pray over our graduates here. Lord, I just want to start out today by giving you praise for giving us uh, another day to be alive. Uh, also, God, I want to give you praise, Lord, for just uh, sustaining Haley and sustaining uh, Miss Kelsey here through uh, school, from getting to them through the tough times and to bringing them to graduation, God. Lord, I pray that you would continue to use them to do good things in this world, that you would use them to continue building your kingdom, God. And I pray as they continue this next phase and journey of their life that, God, they would know that they are not alone, but they have a church family here to support them and to love them along the way, God. And I also pray that they would know, God, that you are with them along the way, that the same God who was with them when they were younger is going to be with them through the next point. For your word says that you will never leave us nor forsake us, God. And I pray that that verse in, thir in Hebrews 13.5 would just be on their hearts. Lord, we say all these things, God, in your son's name we pray. Amen. So thank you very much and congratulations. Good morning, everybody. How are you all doing today? Good. Well, it's good to hear. So last week, what did I talk to you about last week? About You remember? All right, so it's okay. This is a long time. But last week I talked to you about water, okay, and how during the summer months we need to stay hydrated. And the Bible tells us that we need water for two reasons. One, to stay alive physically, but we also need water to stay alive spiritually as well. Now, the spiritual water that we need is not an actual glass of water, but it's a, it's a symbol for our relationship with Jesus, that for us to have eternal life, we have to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of our lives. So that's what we talked about last week. And this week, I want to talk to you about something else that we may uh, take in, that we may eat, that is refreshing for us this summer, and that is with popsicles. So today I want to talk to you about popsicles. So by a show of hands, how many of you guys like popsicles on a hot day? Okay, I know me too. They, they really do hit, hit the spot there. Do any of you have a favorite flavor of a popsicle or something that you like? What do you like? Oh, fudge and chocolate. That's a good one. Chocolate. Okay. How about anyone over here or something that you might like? Any flavors? Oh, cherry. That's a good one too. Okay. So it's good that you guys like popsicles. I know when I was growing up, my favorite was like coconut. I love the coconut flavors of those things. Um, now, when I think of popsicles, I think about our interaction with God's Word or our relationship with God's Word. I think popsicles are a reminder of how God's Word interacts with our lives here. And I say this for a couple of reasons here. The first reason is both require work to access it. Now, when you get popsicles, uh, you have to do some work to eat it. What do you have to do to eat a popsicle? Okay, all right, so you got that. But maybe, like, you have to open it up, and, you know, maybe take what we got. Yeah, you have to buy from the store. You might also have to, um, you know, get the scissors out to, you know, cut open the popsicles, maybe get some napkins so your hands don't get all sticky. You have to do some work ahead of time in order to be able to enjoy it. The same thing is true when it comes to getting things out of God's Word. For us to get things out of God's Word, we can't just have it sitting on a shelf but we have to open it up. We have to read it. We have to uh, dive into it and see what it says, you know. Uh, 2 Timothy 
chapter 2, verse 15 says this, that we need to be diligent to present ourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. So reading the Bible, it, it takes some work on our hands. Like I said, we have to read it. Also, when we're reading it, we also have to pray to God to give us some understanding. And like with popsicles, if you struggle reading your Bible, you can also get your parents to be able to help you read it as well. Just as your parents are willing to help you open up those popsicles, they can help you read God's Word and tell you what it means and what it has to say. Another reason why I say popsicles remind me of God's Word is because both popsicles and God's Word has an effect on our lives. Now, as you shared with me a couple minutes ago, there are different flavors of popsicles. Some of them are sweet, some of them are sour, but each of them serve a purpose. Each of them affect us in some way. Both are good for us, in a sense. And God's Word does the same for us as well. Sometimes when we read God's Word, it makes us feel good. It, it encourages us. Other times, it, it tells us that we need to make a change in our lives. It might be a little sour, but both are good. Both we need to have and take in. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 says this, that uh, when it comes to God's Word, we find that it should convince us, rebuke us, and exhort us with all long-suffering and teaching. And the last reason that I say popsicles remind us of God's Word is because popsicles tend to stick with us. And the same thing is true with God's Word. How many of you get sticky hands after eating a popsicle? I know I always do myself. I have to wash my hands afterwards because feeling it just drives me insane. There's little pieces of it. They just, you know, they, they melt they, and they merge with your hands. And as we read God's Word, it also melts and kind of sticks to us as well. Isaiah 55 verse 11 says, God's word does not return back void. It doesn't return back void. So when you read it, a little part of it sticks to you. It stays inside with you wherever you go. But here's where the difference comes in. Unlike popsicles, we want God's word to actually stick with us and to stay with us going forward going forward because it is God's word that protects us from the enemy. It protects us from temptation. Psalm 119, 11, my favorite verse says this. It says, thy word I have hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. So God's word, when we read it, it sticks to us and it protects us from temptation. So as you guys are enjoying your popsicles this summer, I want you to think about God's word. I want you to enjoy the, your popsicles and also enjoy reading God's word this summer. So I hope that you enjoyed this lesson this morning. And at this time, I would like if you would just, well, before I get into that, would anyone like to pray with us this morning? Would anyone of you like to close us in prayer? All right then, well, just bow your heads with me and I'll pray over us. Father God, I just want to start out by praising you for another day to come together, another day to worship you, God. Lord, I thank you for these children, God, and the blessing that they are to their families and to this church here. God, at this time, I'm praying for the teachers uh, down at the children's church, God, that you would be speaking through them, God, and that you would just uh, be planting seeds in these children, and God, that you would use these children to do great things for your kingdom one day. And God, I'm also praying that as they go throughout the summer, that, Lord, they would have a desire to, to know you deeper and to start reading your word and enjoying it just like they do their treats. Lord, we say all these things in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Isn't it great to be here in the house of the Lord this morning? I said, isn't it great to be here in the house of the Lord this morning? Much better. I want some excitement this morning. Come on, it's time to wake up. You know, <laughs> let's, let's get it. All right, so um, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I would ask if you please turn with me to uh, 2 Peter, looking at chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. And if you have your Bibles and are able to, I would ask if you please stand with me as I get ready to read to you God's Word this morning. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. It reads this, it says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and deliver them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood of the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom, and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward will live ungodly, and deliver righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For the righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. This is the Word of God. God. Please bow your heads with me as I get ready to pray a sin this morning. Dear Lord, I want to start out by giving you praise for giving us this day to come together to be able to worship with you this morning to be able to celebrate the graduates here today, God. Lord, I just, you are worthy of all our praise. So I thank you for all the good things you are doing and have done here in the lives of those here at Springville. So I give you praise for that this morning, God. Lord, at this time, God, I am asking that, God, your spirit would fill me and fill me up with you this morning. That, God, you, the true preacher, would take a step to the front and that I would take a step to the back. Lord, may you speak through me today. May these be your words and not my own. God, I'm praying at this time, Lord, that you would have our full and undivided attention. God, may we cast our worries, our distractions, our anxieties on you, God. May you have our complete attention, God. Lord, we say all these things in your son's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Um, so I want to start out this morning uh, by thanking you guys last week for all that you did for, uh, for being a good host last week to my family, to Grace Church, for welcoming them in here, for your kind words and your gifts uh, that you presented, as well as those of you that were involved in cooking and prepping the meals last week. So thank you guys for, for doing all that. You guys did a wonderful job. Now, I know some of you came up to me afterwards last week, and while I was eating, and you were wanting me to give you your ranking for how you did. And I'd, <laughs> I'd have to say, in my, in my opinion, you get a 10 out of 10. So you guys did a great job with the cook kid here. Uh, that's, that's my expertise opinion here. Um, with that said, though, you guys have uh, met the bar, you know, and, uh, and, and have set that going forward, so... High expectations, know what you guys can do here at Spring Bay. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to start out today by doing a quick recap of Second Peter because it's been a month since we've been in it, and I'd like to refresh us up to what we have talked about and where we are heading today. So Second Peter uh, was written by Peter himself. He is writing to a group of believers or to those who have obtained a precious like faith. In chapter 1, we see that Peter spends a lot of time building up the believer. He does so in a couple of ways. In the first 11 verses of of chapter 1, we see that he starts out by encouraging the believers to grow in the faith. And he gives them reasons as to why they should do so. Then in the middle of chapter 1, we see the metaphor that he gives with, with the tent here, meaning that our lives are temporary here on this earth. And we talked about the implications that it ought to have on us as believers. 
Then chapter 1 wraps up with Peter providing some arguments as to why we can trust the Bible and that the gospel is true. And doing so is vital for us because this is our foundation uh, of our faith and moving forward. Our, our beliefs rest on the truthfulness of this word here. And he gives us a reason as to why we can believe that the Bible is true. And then we get to chapter 2 here. And in chapter 2, it becomes apparent early on why Peter spends so much time trying to build us up as believers. And that is because we live in a reality where there are those within the church today that are trying to tear us down. And this is the reality with the false teachers that we are encountering that are out there. Last time that, is, that I was with you guys, we talked a little bit about false teachers. I shared with you that they exist that they tend to have a large following with them, in part because they preach things uh, that connect to our fleshly, carnal desires. And we ended our discussion last time uh, by sharing how God is judging false teachers as we speak and will judge them on Judgment Day. And this leads to our passage this morning. And in those six verses that we are looking at here, we see that Peter is elaborating on God's judgment of the wicked. And that would include uh, the false teachers. They are included into this fold here. A little outline of our passage kind of looks like this. That is, our passage opens up with Peter giving us three examples from the Old Testament where he judges those who are wicked as well as delivers the righteousness from them. And then Peter ends the section here with verse 9, which perfectly encapsulates the idea and the point that he is trying to get across. Verse 9 or central verse of this passage reads this. It says, And the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the just or the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So Peter's whole point in writing this section here is to assure or to remind the believers that God's judgment is righteous. And he's doing this because... Uh, it appears, or it will appear, that false teachers are not being judged. That they are kind of getting away with things. And God, or Peter, is trying to remind believers, hey, they are going to be judged because God has His track record of always dealing with the wicked here. And as believers today, looking at this same passage, we need to be reminded of God's righteousness when it comes to His judgment. And this leads me into my message this morning, which is titled, God's Righteous Judgment. And there are a couple of reasons why I believe it's important for us to talk about God's judgment, particularly that He is a righteous judge. One of the reasons why I think it's important for us to talk about it is because doing so will give us peace. As I say that to you guys this morning, you may be thinking to yourself, wait on, hold a second here. I mean, I... I don't know if I completely buy that. I mean, I looked at the title of your message this morning, and, and I just read those verses here, and that doesn't give me peace. It makes me afraid to think of God's judgment. And for those of you that are thinking that or feel that, I, I, I will say this to you. That is, I understand where you are coming from. It is natural for us as believers to be afraid of the fact that one day we will stand before uh, the Creator, the Almighty, All-Powerful God. That is a scary thought, at least initially, when we think about it. But whether that is scary for us or not, the reality persists. We will stand before God one day. The Bible tells us every knee shall bow and confess that Jesus is Lord. With that said, I think, it's, I think that it's important for us as Christians to get to know our judge ahead of time while we are here on this earth. And here's the deal, folks. The more we get to know about God, the more we pursue Him, the more evident His righteousness becomes to us. And His righteousness, the more we see His righteousness, it starts to transform us. It turns our feelings of fear into that of peace. And one where we are willing to, to give God praise for being the righteous judge that He is. And this isn't just my word or my thoughts in saying this, but this is evident in the Psalms itself. The psalmist in Psalms 50 Verse 6 says this, he says, Let the heavens declare His righteousness, for God Himself is judge. So one of the reasons I want to talk to you about God's righteousness is because doing so will give us peace. 
The other reason why I believe it's important for us to talk about uh, why God is a righteous judge is because there is a lot of misinformation about God as a judge uh, and that's in our culture today. There are a lot of lies that our culture will try to tell you about God when it comes to how He judges people. Perhaps you've heard some of them before or some things along these lines. You may have heard people say to you before that God is not good because He lets those who are evil get away with things. You may hear people in the world today tell you that God isn't righteous because of His judgments in the past. They'll say that He indiscriminately judges or He doesn't judge people fairly or equally. And at the same time, you also hear you will hear people say that God has changed, that He is no longer interested in judging, that that was the God of the Old Testament. Now the New Testament God is all about love and acceptance. You'll hear people say these things, but they're simply not true. And my goal this morning is to strengthen you, to protect you from these lies by exploring what His Word has to say about his judgment. And when we do so, you will see that he is the righteous God that the Bible declares him to be. In the time that we have together, I want to share with you three reasons that, or three things that this passage lays out before us that lets us know that God is a righteous judge. These reasons being one, that God knows how to judge the unjust. The second reason being God knows how to deliver the godly. And the third reason is that God is a righteous judge because His judgment gives us peace. It is His judgment that gives us peace. So let's talk about the first reason here. That is, God knows how to judge the unjust. Look with me at verse 4. It says, For if God did not spare the angels who sin, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So in verse 4 here, we see the story, or rather a summary, of God's judgment on the fallen angels. The fallen angels in this case would be the unjust here in the passage. And for the next couple of minutes, I want to share with you the story of the fallen angels in greater detail, as we kind of need to be brushed up upon that. And then I want to share with you what this story reveals to us about God's judgment. So let's talk about the story of the fallen angels. Now, the scriptures, uh, I'll say this, there is not like one singular passage that perfectly tells us the story of how the angels fell. But rather, we need to piece several scriptures together to get a clear picture of what actually took place here. So, uh, let's talk about this story. The fallen angels were led by the chief or the original fallen angel of Satan or Lucifer as he was when he, known as when he was an angel. So Lucifer was a cherub. What do we know about Lucifer when he was an angel? Well, let me read to you Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 13 through 15. It says, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, burial, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. So in those three verses there in Ezekiel, we learn a couple of things about Lucifer when he was an angel. We see that Lucifer was with God originally. In the passage, it says he was on the holy mountain of God and that he walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. So Lucifer literally stood and guarded God's throne. He was in the presence of God. What else do we know about him as a fallen angel, or before he fell, rather? Well, we know that Lucifer was honored by God. He was honored by God through how he was created. In the passage, it says that he was the seal of perfection, that he was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. In addition to to being honored through his creation, we see that Lucifer was honored through the position that he was given as well. Lucifer, folks, was given the most honored position in the universe. 
He had the position with the most prestige to it. And that was, he was the original worship leader up in heaven. He was leading the charges for God's praise. In the passage it says, The workmanship of your timbrels and your pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. So I think it's fair to say that Lucifer, he had it good in the beginning. He had everything that anyone could ever ask for. And so, what led to his fall then? How could Lucifer possibly fall? Well, it's because Lucifer had one sin in his life. And that was the sin of pride. He had a lust to be on par, to be equal with God. In Isaiah chapter 14, verses 14 through 15, it says this. It says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. So Lucifer ultimately was, ended up being thrown out of heaven, but not before he convinced the other angels in heaven to join him. In Revelations 12.4, it says, His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth here. So that's the story of how the angels fell there. And we see the judgment being uh, pronounced onto them through that story. And now we are left asking ourselves, what does God's judgment on the fallen angels reveal to us about God? Well, I think his judgment reveals to us that God knows how to judge the unjust. And I say this for two main reasons. First, I say that God knows how to judge the unjust because he doesn't let anyone that is evil get away with things. No one is too high, too mighty to escape God's judgment. Look back with me at the beginning of verse 4. It says, For if God did not spare the angels who sin. What did I just share with you about the fallen angels a couple of seconds ago? In particular, Satan. I share with you that they were high and mighty. That these were the most beautiful, most intelligent beings to exist. That they had positions of prestige. Far more prestigious than anyone could have here on this earth. They were in the presence of God. And yet they found out that they too, when they gave into sin, uh, were capable or were able to be judged by God. Now why do I bring this up to you guys today? Why do I mention this? Why well, I bring this up for this reason. That is, if the fallen angels couldn't escape God's judgment, then no one else can. No one else is above or can escape God's judgment. And that includes ourselves as well. So one of the reasons why I say God knows how to judge the unjust is because he doesn't let evil escape his judgment. The other reason is because God has consistently done so. He has been judging the wicked since the beginning of time. And the story of the fallen angels highlights this. In the beginning, we see that God judged the angels initially by casting them down to hell. And the word for hell here in this passage is actually the Greek word Tartarus. And Tartarus refers to the deepest, lowest part of hell. And I don't know about you, but I find it fitting that those that have had the greatest sense of pride, that thought the most highly of themselves, were now cast down to the lowest parts of earth. I just thought that was interesting. So we see that God has been judging them in the past, since the beginning of time. But not only has he judged them in the past, he is judging them in the now and in the future. Look with me at how verse 4 ends. It says, And he delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So currently, fallen angels, at least some of them, are in prison. They are shackled up. That's where they are right now. And they are awaiting judgment day in the future. It says that they are being reserved for judgment. And these are reservations that they cannot cancel. They cannot escape this. It is set in stone for them. Now you may be curious, what does this judgment look like for the fallen angels? What is the fate that awaits them? Well, for Satan or Lucifer, his judgment is detailed in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, which says, The devil who deceived him was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And this same weight, or the same fate awaits the other fallen angels. So to wrap up this first point, we see that God is a righteous judge because he knows how to judge the unjust. He's been doing it uh, consistently, and he doesn't let anyone that is wicked escape his grasp. 
The second reason why I say that God uh, is a righteous judge is because He knows how to deliver the godly. God knows how to deliver the godly. Look with me at verses 5 through 8. It says, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood of the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, and condemned them to destruction, which made them an example to those afterward who live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. So in this passage, we get an allusion to two different stories in Genesis. One of the stories we get an allusion to is that of Noah's Ark, and the other is to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. In both of these stories, we see how God uh, not only judged the wicked, but knew how to deliver the godly. And this makes him righteous. So how does God deliver the godly? How does he go about doing so? Well, we see that God delivers the godly by removing the wicked from them. Look with me at verses 5 through 6. It says, And did not spare the ancient world, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those afterward who would live ungodly. So God delivered the godly by removing the wicked from them. In the case of Noah, he sent upon a flood to the ancient world, which removed the ungodly from them. For Lot, he uh, you know, judged the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by turning them into ashes. In both cases, he wiped away the ancient world and those ancient cities off the map. And the same thing will be true for man on Judgment Day. God will one day remove the wicked people from those who are righteous. They will be permanently separated from us. Revelation 21.8 tells us this. It says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So God knows how to deliver the godly uh, through removing the wicked. We also see that God knows how to deliver the godly through the grace that he offers. Look back with me at the beginning of verse 5. It says, Did not spare the ancient world, but save Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So contrary to popular belief, God just didn't wake up one day on the wrong side of the bed and decided to destroy the whole world. He didn't do it in a fit of rage. Instead, there was a 120-year period from when he told Noah about the coming flood until the floods actually came. And in the between time, Noah wasn't just working on the ark. Instead, we see that Noah was actually preaching God's word and sharing the warning to those around him. That's why the text says he was a preacher of righteousness. So God gave people a period of 120 years to repent, to change their ways, to get on board with what Noah was saying. But ultimately, they wouldn't. They they would not repent and turn away. And the same thing that was true in Noah's time is true now with how God deals with the world around us. I believe all of us at some point in our lives have asked ourselves some variation of this question. That is, we wonder, why doesn't God just snap His fingers and destroy the wicked? Clearly, God has the power to do so. So why doesn't He? Well, it's because God desires for everyone to be saved. He desires everyone to be saved. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3-4 through says this. It says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Let me tell you this, each and every single one of us that are in here today are recipients of God's grace. We all have received God's grace. We have been delivered through it. It was His grace that has sustained us and has gotten us to the point where we eventually became saved ourselves and thus ultimately spared from the fate that is detailed in Revelation 21.8. So we see God knows how to deliver the godly by removing the wicked, by offering His grace, 
We also see that God knows how to deliver the godly through being able to identify them. The beginning of verse 5 says, But God saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood of the world of the ungodly, and delivered righteous light. So how was God able to deliver the godly? Well, it's because He knows who they are. You see, in a world that was full of corruption, full of violence, God saw Noah, a man that was a preacher of righteousness. He found the needle in the haystack and spared him. And he did the same thing with Lot as well. In a city that was filled with evil people, God found righteous Lot and spared him from that. God could have easily just said, the heck with this world, let's just destroy it. But that's not who He is. He looks for those who are righteous, those who are godly, and tries to spare them, and does do so. Let me tell you this. When judgment day comes for us, folks, God is going to be able to identify us. He's going to be able to identify us. Revelations 20.15 says, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Listen, folks, when you accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, you are going to be written in the book of life. He's going to spare you from that judgment on Judgment Day. Now, here's the good news, folks. God's delivery just does not stop with Him identifying a problem. Instead, as we look at this passage, we see that God delivers the godly through His action and through His intervention as well. In the case of Noah, we see that God steps down and gives Noah instructions to build the ark to save him and his family. With Lot, we see that God intervenes. He sends angels to him and his family to warn them about the destruction coming on the city. And eventually, he helps them get out of there. Let me tell you this, folks. The same God who intervened and delivered Noah and Lot is willing to do the same thing for us. He has delivered us from our consequence, or the judgment of sin that will be poured out into man. John 3.16, you all know it, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, God took the steps to save us from the consequence of sin. He did the steps by giving us His Son, Jesus. And His Word tells us the only way to escape this consequence is by believing in Him. For us to be saved, we need to be like Noah and Lot. We need to be obedient to God's Word and place our faith and trust in Him as they did themselves. So, at this point, we discuss that God is a righteous judge because He knows how to judge the unjust and He delivers the godly. The last reason that I want to share with you this morning that proves that God is a righteous judge is He is righteous because His judgment gives us peace. God's judgment brings us peace. And that proves He is righteous. Look with me at verse 9 this morning. Look with me at verse 9. It says, Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So the context of verse 9, as I shared with you earlier when I started it out, is that Peter is using this verse, and really this passage, to address the worries of the believers when it comes to God's judgment. He's trying to address their worries, trying to give them peace about the judgment of God. Notice how Peter starts off verse 9 here, in his response to them. He starts off verse 9 by saying, Then the Lord knows. In other words, Peter's point is this. He's saying that God knows what He is doing when it comes to judgment. And the word knows here suggests perfection. That God always makes the right decision, the right judgment. In this verse, we see Peter's supreme confidence in God. And it is his confidence in God and in God's judgment that gives us peace. Why do I say that God's judgment gives us peace? Well, I say this as a Christian this morning because of what I witness in this broken world that we live in. We live in a world where we see a lot of corrupt judges. Judges who too frequently send the innocent to jail and set the guilty free. They frequently make wrong decisions. And their judgment gives me anything but peace. It makes me worry and it makes me scared. 
with God, I don't feel those things. I get peace instead because He is perfect in His judgment. And it's through this premise that God is perfect in judgment and the confidence that Peter has in, in God's ability to judge that he's able to give peace to the believers here. That he's able to address the worries and concerns that they have about God's judgment. One of the worries that Peter addresses is that of whether or not God will address the wicked. Whether or not He will judge them. And the believers are worried about this because of the reality of false teachers and the appearance that they will not be or that they aren't being judged. Peter dismantles this worry through the example of the fallen angels that I shared with you a couple of seconds ago. And his point boils down to this. If the fallen angels who serve God and worshiped Him can't escape or aren't above being judged by God, then the false teachers aren't either. They too, as members of the unjust, are being reserved under punishment for the day of judgment. So that is one of the worries that Peter seeks to, to quiet down. The other worry that Peter addresses, that he brings peace to, is that of the concern of whether or not God will protect believers from being caught up in the destruction in the lives that false teachers bring. Peter addresses this worry by saying God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. A couple of minutes ago, I share with you examples of how God delivered righteous or godly men in Noah and Lot. But as I share this with you, you may be thinking, okay, but that is a different circumstance. He delivered them from wicked people, but not false teachers per se. So what is God doing to deliver the godly, to protect those who are godly, the believers from false teachers? What is God doing? Well, He does two things to protect and to deliver the believers from false teachers. One of the things He does is He offers us His salvation. John 10.28 says this, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of My hand. Listen, folks, false teachers can cause confusion for the believers. They can cause us to be confused. But what they cannot do is cause a believer to lose their salvation. They cannot do that. They are not powerful enough to remove the salvation we have from God. The other thing that God does to protect and deliver believers from false teachers is He gives us His Word. Ephesians 6.14 says, Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. Just as a belt keeps our uniform or alpha in place, the same thing is true with God's Word. God's Word holds us together. It keeps us from falling apart when we encounter false teachings. It keeps us secure in Him. Now, as I say this to you this morning, I would be remiss if I didn't share this with you. That is, God just doesn't deliver us or protect us from false teachers, but He delivers and protects us from the wicked period. End of the discussion. You know, I think as Christians, we give too much power to the enemy today. We give too much power to the enemy. We attribute too much power to him. We look out in the world around us. We see the situations that we live in in this society. And sometimes we wonder, can we truly overcome this world that we live in? Well, we can. We can overcome this world. And we can overcome it through God. The Bible tells us that he who is in us is greater than he who lives in this world. Let me tell you this, God just doesn't deliver us from wicked people, but he delivers us from wicked things, and he delivers us from their schemes and tactics that they use against us, namely temptation. Let me read to you 1 Corinthians 10.13. It says, No temptation has ever taken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. As I was reading this verse this week, a question popped into my mind that I'm asking myself and I want to ask you this morning. That is, are you walking in the deliverance that God has given you? Are you walking in the deliverance this morning that God has given you? Or do you believe that, that the world is stronger than God? As I end with you guys today, I'd like to leave with you on these final thoughts. Today we talked about God's righteous judgment. We said that God is a righteous judge because He knows how to handle the wicked. He knows how to judge the unjust. 
And we say he knows how to do this because no one is above his judgment. And he's been always judging the evil since the beginning of time. He's doing it now and will do it in the future ahead. We also said that God is a righteous judge because he knows how to deliver the godly. God does this by identifying those who are godly, by removing the wicked from us, by offering us his grace, and by intervening in our lives. Last but not least, we discuss that God is a righteous judge because of the peace we get from his judgment. As I leave with you guys today, I want to ask you one more question, one more thing to think about. That is this. If you guys were to die today, to pass on, how would the righteous God judge you? How would he judge you this morning? Would he deem you godly or among the unjust as we see in the passage? Where are you going to spend your eternity if you pass away today? Would it be with God or would it be with the fallen angels who are and will be in hell? A place that the Bible tells us the fire there never quenches. A place that is of uh, darkness and one of eternal suffering. Where are you going to spend your eternity this morning, folks? Maybe you are here this morning and you believe that you are going to spend eternity with God. If that is the case, why? Why do you believe you're going to spend eternity with God this morning? Do you believe you're going to spend eternity with God because you're not that bad of a person? Perhaps you looked at the text today and you say, hey, I'm not violent like those in Noah's times or corrupt like them. I'm also not as perverse as those who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm not as wicked as they are back then. Perhaps you've also done some good things in your life. Maybe you've done many good deeds in your life as well. Let me tell you this, folks. If that is your thought process this morning as to why you're going to spend eternity with God, I want to let you know that the Bible tells us otherwise, that you would be mistaken. The Bible tells us that all have sinned, that everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And let me tell you this. All it takes is one sin in our life to be counted as unjust, to be thrown out, to be removed from God's presence forever. We saw this take place with the angels in heaven. One sin they did with pride, and they were gone forever, away, separated from God. Let me also share with you this. That no amount of good deeds you can do in your life will ever cancel out the bad deeds. You can, do, you can have one sin in your life and try to do a thousand good works. And those thousand good works are not going to erase the one sin or blemish you have. That's not how this works. The Bible tells us that this is the case. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So as you're sitting here this morning and maybe wondering, man, where is our hope? How can we spend eternity with God? Is there a way? Well, the, this passage tells us that there is. If we want to spend eternity with God, we need to become godly. And we become godly when we accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of our lives. Doing this transforms our identity. We go from being a sinner to a person that was unjust to now being a righteous son and daughter of God. Romans 3.22 says, Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. So I'm asking you this, this morning this one more question. That is, will today be the day that you accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life? Will you accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life while you still have the opportunity to do so? While God's grace is still shining upon you this morning? If not, then I want to share with you what will happen if you don't. If you decide to reject the Gospel, decide to reject Jesus, as being the Savior of your life, the Bible tells us that your fate on Judgment Day will be worse than the fate of those who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. Your fate will be worse than them because you, unlike them, had, had the opportunity to hear the Gospel. At this time, I want to let you guys know that the altar is open for you guys today. If you are here this morning and are in need of salvation or sanctification, I want to let you know that God is willing to meet you right now, right where you are at. He is willing to deliver you from what you are going through and to show you His grace and love today.
please, folks, do not leave here this morning not knowing whether or not you are saved. Accept the opportunity right now to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life while you have the opportunity to do so. Would you please bow your heads with me as I get ready to pray over us this morning? Father God, I thank you once again for giving us another day to be here, to dive into your word. Lord, I thank you that your word, God, gives us peace. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you are a righteous judge. We live in a world full of corruption, full of corrupt judges. But God, I give you praise that you, being being the God, being the one that has the end all, be all say on things, is the true righteous judge. Lord, I'm praying, God, if there's anyone in here today that does not know you as a Savior of your life, of their life, God, I'm praying today would be the day that they would accept you as your Savior of their life. God, if not, I'm just praying that you would continue pressing upon their hearts. Lord, as we get ready to leave here today, God, I pray that we would, we would just continue to seek you and follow your will that you have set in store for us. May we honor you with all of our aspects of our lives, God. Lord, we say all these things in your son's name we pray. Amen. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace.